evening and welcome back to our second episode of the Wednesday Night Photo Show, our little chance to sit around and chat and talk photography with everybody for a little while. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Scott, I'm the main photo instructor here with Dan. And with me tonight, I've got Ben. Ben, you want to introduce yourself over here? How's it going, everyone? My name is Ben. Obviously, I'm one of your neighborhood equipment specialists. When you come into the store with any questions, I'm one of your photographic experts from everything from lighting to photography to video, you name it, we can definitely help you with those questions. All right, so tonight's episode is a Q&A episode. We want to hear from you for your photography questions. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, I know some people have sent some stuff in, but if you've got any stuff that comes up, just pop them in the chat. We will throw them up on the screen and we will answer your questions live on the show tonight. Um, but first I want to talk a little bit, well, let's take a minute to look at what kind of stuff we've been doing. Ben, is there anything, what have you been shooting lately and what kind of gizmos or gear has been indispensable for you? Oh my gosh, there have been some really fun tools that we've been able to play with uh, here in the store as well as for my work personally. Um, it's been a really fun time to you know take advantage of the weather and going outside and playing in the snow, but we're getting those warmer days, so it's a good time to focus on uh, some creepy, funky architectural shots too and just really taking advantage of that. On those colder days, I've actually been really utilizing my macro photography work to just take better food photos around the house or, uh, you know, I've been in getting into house plants, just taking more macro photography shots. I'm not getting out as much. So kind of utilizing what's in my bag, but small lighting uh, that's portable and easy to use has been super helpful. Like the Lytra Cube, which is actually what I'm using for my Zoom call today. That's been oh, yeah, yeah. wildly beneficial. Yeah, I've got one of those in my bag and it's just like always in there. It's a handy little, pretty powerful light source for that tiny little thing that it is, right? And like, it, it gets brighter. I mean, so I'll turn it off. And it's just- Exactly. Yeah, all the way up, it's like blinding. I believe they actually still hold the record for the most power at that small of a size. So there's some really cool stuff. Um, and I also even took some uh, photos today with the Godox R1 and M1 Mini. Uh, full color spectrum LED. Oh, light. I want to play around with one of those. I took some samples today with Valeria in the store. Um, if I'm able to share my screen in a couple seconds, I might be able to pull that up for you guys because uh, I just imported them into Lightroom, so I barely even touched them. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, but a lot of cool stuff going on and tons, tons to play with as always for you guys. Mine lately has been my big honking tripod. Yeah. Like I pulled this thing back out because it's got the big spiky feet on. There you go. And uh, that always comes out this time of year when things get icy or gross, like the big spiky metal feet are kind of indispensable for me in the winter. Oh, it's a huge peace of mind. I mean, you know, we invest all of that into a tripod and, you know, lugging it out there with us. If it's something bigger and heavier, it's nice to know that it's not going to go anywhere because if it's not stable, it's not doing its job, right? Yeah. Right. And I'm one of those weirdos who like, oh, it got like super cold and icy and stuff. I'm going to like walk down to the stream in the woods and... <laughs> I've definitely made some of my best work. I make a mess of myself. Triple out for sure. Yeah. The other thing that I've been messing around with lately, I had a student who came for an, for a couple of private lessons uh, oh. through this, the fall, and she was shooting film. Okay. And we've got like a couple more people who've started asking about shooting film lately. So I decided to drag out this beast. Oh, oh, yes, please. <laughs> so oh, this is my new project. I'm going to be shooting some film this winter, and we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Oh, gorgeous stuff. Medium format is amazing. We've actually, now that you mentioned it, we've had such a huge uptick in the last few months of film sales, but we also have a higher level of film offerings and we're even, you know, upgrading our services. You know, in the past, if you wanted to get uh, prints and having a digital file too, your only option was a disc for the most part. And now we're upgrading uh, so that you can get high res and standard res on a USB. Oh, right, right. Yeah. You can even get it uh, loaded right into your photo finale account so you can order your photos from Dan's Picture Works and exactly. for free, for free. Yep. And, you know, for all those college students that are in the area, if you want to just drop off your film and you know it's going to be a while until you're back, we'll send you a Dropbox link. So we're, you know, making it more accessible. And film is always so much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I mean, I don't know about you, but like I've got this brand new laptop and it doesn't have a CD drive in it. 
Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> annoying. It's kind of annoying. It's nice to be able to, you know, still enjoy that without it being a chore. You know, I mean, yeah. we're taking all this time to create something special with film now, um, you know, and you still are excited to see how it's going to look. It's annoying to have to go through another step when, of course, our lab is so amazing. Where am I going to get a CD drive to plug in? To <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then, you know, what do you do with it afterwards? It just goes right. in the trash. Um, I do, if I'm able to share my screen, I can pull up uh, some of those photos that we did with those colored light gels if you want to take a look at those, because um, those are fun for samples. Can I do a screen share? Let's see how that's going to work. Yeah. You hit a share screen button at the bottom there. Does that work for you? Uh, yep. So if I go share screen, okay. Oh, it wants all sorts of security things. Okay, fine. I guess I'll let it happen. All right. <laughs> if it's for, if it's for you guys, that's cool. <laughs> I'm a snoop around on your laptop from here. Are you able to see? I'm not seeing anything yet. Maybe this isn't. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. We can always post those to the. Uh, yeah, we'll get those in the Facebook. up in the Facebook group. That's all right though. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's been so much fun to play with, you know, just different samples and creating a different vibe. I mean, we're all cooped in, so a lot of us are kind of in hibernation mode. I, mean, I have a lot of people coming in that, you know, I might know them as a bird photographer or a portrait photographer, and they're coming in with all sorts of different things. We have a lot of people that are just trying new things. So it's been fun. Yeah, like you said, macro, I think it would be one that's like great yeah. for, it's winter, it's gross outside, I'm not going out, but like, Macro is one of those things like, it's like four square feet and I can find something interesting to take a picture of with a macro lens, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Even just plant leaves or, you know, cooking or, you know, creating yeah. different decorations for the house. We have a lot of people. Right. Staring Head fly on the windowsill. Right. Like, Ooh. Well, good autofocus can help for that. Good <laughs> autofocus can help for that. I, I definitely love my Sony 90 millimeter. Uh, the autofocus on that macro lens is just fantastic. Nice. Yeah. Um, for those of you that are just tuning in, make sure to you know type in some questions either on YouTube or Facebook in the comments. We will answer those as they come in. Scott will mediate on that. All right, so we going through some questions that I've got here. Oh, there's a good one. What is mirrorless and why does it matter? I've had a couple of people in some intro classes like, what's the deal yeah. with this mirrorless thing that I hear about? Oh my well, goodness. Let's take a minute and go over that. Yeah, I mean, how far back do we want to go? Um, so when film became digital, you know, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you're holding a film camera up to your face, you put it up, you're looking through the viewfinder, you're actually looking through a series of mirrors and then down out through the lens in real time. You click the button, the mirror flips up and light comes in through the lens and hits the negative and that's right, right. the image. Fast forward into digital. So we got this guy, the like there's an actual mirror in there. Exactly, exactly. That right. little it's thing. like looking through a window when you look through the viewfinder. Exactly. So light would come through now, the mirror flips up and it hits a right. sensor. It hits a sensor, which essentially is the negative for digital you know, world. With mirrorless, there's no mirror. So what that means is the camera in real time is reading electronically off the sensor. So when you're looking through a viewfinder, you're seeing exactly what the camera sees and here's the biggest part. This is the most crucial thing. You're gonna know what the image looks like before you take it. Yeah. You're gonna know what the image looks like before you take it. Yeah. It's what been hard for me to go back to yeah. this guy after shooting with this guy. Yeah, I, I've been shooting mirrorless myself professionally for the last four years now, four or five years now. So yeah. it's it's a little hard to go back to, but you know, one of the big benefits is knowing what the image is gonna look like before you take it me coming from a film background, I know you have a very deep film background yourself. There's this little voice in the back of my head that says, oh, that's that's like cheating, right? No, <laughs> no, it's not. You're freeing up creative brain power to focus more on the image that you're creating and less on, do I have my exposure right? Is my focus point where it needs to be? Do I have white balance correct? All that crazy nerdy stuff that makes photography a craft, we're still focusing on it. It's just a little bit less of a crucial thing to focus on. So now right, I can right. worry about what's in front of my face. You know, did my subject move? Did the light change? Is my bride, um, you know, still comfortable and paying attention? Did, you know, a necklace move? I can pay attention to the details. And then at the end of the day, I can get back to my life 
So I'm not <laughs> my entire life through a lens. Yeah. You know what? I, I've had a couple of people like in classes who've been, well, is it cheating to do it this way? Well, think about it like this. If you go out and you buy a new chainsaw, right? Mm -hmm. Is it cheating to start the engine? Or do you just like take that thing and hack away at a tree with that? Like it's a power tool, right? Like use all the tools that are available to you. It's a newer technology that allows us to kind of push the bar on great photography further and makes for somebody entering into it, it makes it easier to learn. You know, if I change the shutter speed or if I change all right. the picture, I'm going to know. So that makes it easier to learn how that's going to affect my picture. Yeah, because yeah, you get that immediate feedback. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the other great things, because it's reading electronically, now we have improved autofocus, being able to not only recognize a subject and not even recognize a face, now we have technologies that recognize the human eyeball. Imagine what that does for your peace of mind when you, your kid is you know, running around the playground or you know, running through your house, or if you have a pet, because pet eye focus is a thing now too, knowing that all of your photos are gonna be much more successful, you've got more photos to choose from, and then you don't have to check and you can put the camera back down and go back to your life. All mm -hmm. wonderful things. <laughs> are there any cases where you think that, uh, like I know there are some people that still prefer the SLR, the mirrorless system. It's where are some of the really things where part. that kind of comes in? Yeah, it, it's changing all the time. Um, as mirrorless kind of you know grows more and more, and just for a little bit of history, it's been in the industry at the level that it's been with different companies for like the last six years. As it grows, we're seeing that bullet list of you know why DSLRs might still be better than mirrorless shrink. Now, sure. yeah. one of the things that you know, depending on which company you're talking about, like if you're talking about Canon or uh, Nikon, for example, who still have you know a foot in both realms, you might have more lenses to choose from, meaning more affordable lenses to get started with or diversify your lineup if you want to look at a DSLR. Now, one major caveat to that now is the fact that both of those companies have adapters to be able to use all of their DSLR lenses. So if you have a DSLR camera, you really like mirrorless, but you really love your lenses, it's okay. They figured that out for you and they work really well. Another area is um, you know fast action autofocus. If you're maybe a pro wildlife photographer or if you're really into sports, um, there are some phenomenal options for you within uh, Sony and Icon, some within Canon too, um, that mm -hmm. are gonna address that need for fast burst action as well as good autofocus. You might potentially, depending on your price point that you wanna get into, that's kind of the big thing. Depending on your price point, a DSLR is still gonna do really, really well for you. And that might be yeah. the way to go. I think that's one of the ones that I've heard like some sports shooters still prefer their DSLRs for yeah, some of those reasons. Definitely. Um, one of the technologies- oh, that seems, Man, that some of the Sony stuff and what they've done with the super, super fast action. Yeah, Sony A9- Like you said, it gets narrower and narrower that- Exactly. One of the great things about that, the Sony A92 has what we call a global shutter. So since there's no mirror, there's no mechanical shutter being involved all the time, you can kind of have it pulled directly off of the sensor. Let's say uh, you're somebody that photographs baseball, golf, really fast birds of prey that have super fast wing beats. Those are things that at super high shutter speeds and super high movement, as you're tracking through, you might find that that straight golf club might start to have a little bit of a bend oh, in it. Right. That hockey stick, anything that's a long item that's supposed to be straight, you might see a little bit of a bend. That's something that Sony has worked really, really hard to address with a global shutter. But to get into that, you're gonna be looking at about $4,500. <laughs> that one's not cheap. Flagship feature. Now granted, if you're shooting, you know, Friday night high school football or something like that, where there isn't a stick, rock and roll. But if you want to get into it affordably, something like a Nikon D500 or a Canon 90D or a mm -hmm. 7 Mark II even is going to do a great job for you. We got a question from Carol while we're on the subject. What yeah. Nikon mirrorless camera is the best to get? Oh, Carol, it's good to hear from you. Well, you know <laughs> very well. We've talked many times. So best is kind of a dangerous word around here. Best All for right. what kind of photography? Best yeah. for what kind of um, you know final product. If you're somebody that wants it to be easy to use, that might not be something that you know, you're gonna be able to do huge prints out of. Me uh, photographing weddings and doing commercial work, 
one of my cameras photographs at 60 megapixels. It's not necessarily my first choice for low light photography. I'm gonna grab something with a lower megapixel system. So best is relative. Now, granted within Nikon's Z mirrorless lineup, they did just announce their Z7 and Z6 II, which we have been getting in for customers. If you wanna get your hands on one, you need to do a special order. It's $100 as a refundable setup, but that's how you're gonna be able to see them right now. Those two cameras, the big things that they finally addressed were having dual memory card slots, which is a oh, huge piece of mind yeah. thing, but their autofocus got a big bump too. Outside of that, it's mostly the same camera, but those mm -hmm. are two major things. Now, granted, if you're not a fast action shooter or if you're not doing paid gigs, it's not a big deal and you can really save a lot of money by going with the Z6 and Z7. Oh, okay. If you're interested in video specifically, you actually want to look at the Z6 or Z6 II because video, you actually will get a lot of benefits from having lower megapixels. That translates to better low light performance. Right, right. So best is relative, but that's why it's always good to come in and talk to us, email us. We can talk that through and make sure that it's, you know, perfectly. Or the thing that you want to do. Or you, exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah, and the, like the benefit of being able to like take it outside, take a couple of pictures with it, see how it feels in your hand and what it's going to do for you. Exactly. Yeah. Or take advantage of the massive rental pool that we have. People forget that, you know, buying isn't your only option. I can recommend that and say, hey, I have. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, try this out for a few days. Go take it for a week. Go take it for yeah. a weekend. You know, the rates on that are fantastic because you get a discount um, starting at like 50% off if you get it for three nights. All right. So we got another question here. I want to become a pro. Me too. <laughs> Me too, Marcus. Um, which is actually my, my let's name. think about like what would your first steps be like to get onto your the first rung on the ladder somebody who wants to take this thing and start turning it into a profession we could talk about that as like a whole show by itself oh um, for sure what like I would maybe some first steps what i would recommend first off your lenses are the most important thing. The camera will get replaced within a few years. You wanna make sure that you're investing in good lenses. That translates to any kind of work because sharpness and low light allows you to say yes to all sorts of scenarios. Maybe look at something a little bit more professional, not so much all in one lenses or going into um, you know travel lenses that have a lot of versatility. You wanna get tighter ranges that are more specified and they're gonna give you better optical quality. That's everything. Probably the other big thing is learn how to edit your photos. You know, if you're mm. just taking the photo, you're only doing half the work. It's just like any other profession, you need to add your seasoning, the thing that makes it your image. People come to me because I create a, a specific look, but I also connect with them in a specific way. At the end of the day, your camera is your tool. They're hiring you. So what do you need to work on? A lot of people know that answer immediately for themselves. Cool, yeah. That'd be a good place to start. The thing that I would add is uh, one of the things that I have done getting started um, was to find some organizations to volunteer for. Yeah, yeah, that can it, be a really like, cool I'm cutting my teeth on like working on projects, shooting events for different organizations or shooting like they need this thing for a publicity photo, but it gave me experience of doing professional work. Yep. The nonprofit that I'm volunteering for was happy to get some pictures. I got some stuff from my portfolio. It was a win-win all around. So yep. I think like finding somebody that you can kind of build a relationship and volunteer with yeah, and be a way to it back kind of build that up. Working and you're building it, um, but you're also kind of growing those skills because you might feel really confident one day, and then you walk out of a shoot and say, "Gosh, I really blew it. I could have done better with that." So it's good to you know, kind of soften the blow on jumping into the industry, um, which is always changing, um, but also, you know, kind of growing a portfolio in a safe way. One yeah. of the things that, interestingly enough, we do get you know asked occasionally is how do I know when to start charging or I don't know how to start that conversation. I used to have a lot of anxiety about that in the beginning. Mm. I knew I was taking, you know, decent work. You know, I was, I was, uh, you know, doing some solid stuff. I had a photojournalistic background. I'm actually a second generation photographer. So I grew up with some of it, but I didn't necessarily have the business end of it down. So I felt like I was doing the volunteering thing a lot and it's still my time. Mm -hmm. so one of the things that I did to hold myself accountable, 
but to kind of create a really nice friendly transition into more of a business dialogue because professional for a lot of people means making money off of this. Right. If someone would reach out and say, hey, Ben, I really love your work. Can you shoot X for me? Sure, no problem. Let me get you a quote. Super, super simple line, sets the tone, holds you accountable. You're not saying, yes, it costs this much. And if they decide, you know what? Let's take a look at this or yeah, great. No problem. You immediately know how to move forward from there. Cause that can be a little bit of a kind of a, an awkward thing. It's like, you know, asking your boss for a raise or something like that, which reminds me, I think you left the door. <laughs> I tried to hurt the door slam, but that can be a really great way to, you know, take things to a more professional level. Yeah. I like that. Cool. All right. So Jim asks, are there any plans for Nikon revamping the 200 to 400 F4? Not that I've heard. Um, as much as I would love to say, Jim, that we have, you know, a secret man on the inside, we're reading things just a little faster than you are. Um, we haven't really heard a lot from them as far as a super telephoto um, lineup, you know, as far as that's concerned. A lot of Nikon's attention within the new year is pushing everything into that mirrorless technology and the lenses for that. So, you know, super telephoto lines uh, for DSLRs, especially not getting as much of attention as they want. Um, what that might mean, though, is, you know, maybe look at some different options outside of Nikon within that range that's, you know, kind of a, a decent amount of reach, but fairly decent low light as well. Um, so I guess it's just a question of what do you care about more, the low light at that kind of reach or just more reach? You've got a couple different options. So we can talk that through with you more, but Nikon really hasn't given any indication that they're planning on coming out with any lenses like that. Most of their roadmap, if you will, has been focused towards those mirrorless lenses. Actually, I just got a question from um, one of my students last week that was asking about like, how's the like the Nikon Z series lens selection going? Cause she was looking at one of the Z cameras and was kind of it like when I first got this camera, there were just a few lenses available. What's that situation looking like right now? Growing uh, very much. And actually one of the amazing things, I know we've talked about it. Um, COVID has made it very difficult to supply a lot of these high end pieces towards, um, you know, all the different camera companies, Nikon, you know, is not immune to that. Oh, sure. Um, one of the things that we're kind of seeing now is we have, you know, the 20 millimeter 1.8, we have an 85 millimeter 1.8, the 35, the 50, which is actually the sharpest 50 millimeter 1.8 that anybody makes, which is kind of cool. They're patting themselves on the back for that a lot. But we now have a 24 to 70. We have a 70 to 200. We have a 14 to 24. We have a 14, uh, we have an old, what is it, 14, 24 at f2.8, and it can take filters. So there are a lot of different lenses, but don't forget with that really affordable adapter, you can hop back into the stuff that already exists with right. no performance lags, as long as it's within the current lineup, which is over 90 lenses and they're very affordable and you're still getting the performance that you would get even if you were at the high end of the uh, Nikon DSLR. So don't forget that that's your only route but that is growing and we do have a lot of them in stock. So make sure that you're keeping in touch with us. Nice. Yeah, it's gotten a lot better. Oh, hey, Kathleen's back. Hey. Thanks for joining us again. Yeah, good to see you. That well. awesome snowy owl picture last week. Woo. All right, so uh, is there a lens for astro and landscape in one lens? I have the D850 and do strictly wildlife, but want to try more. Ah. Love me some yeah. astro work. I was actually just editing some Milky Way shots earlier today. So it depends on how much low light performance you want with astro star photography, for those that are wondering what that means. Um, typically people are looking at a ultra wide lens that just shows lots of the, lots of the, uh, the environment itself as well as lots right. of the sky but we wanna be able to let in lots of light. The D850 is super high resolution, but because it has so much detail, it's gonna be very sensitive to grain and low light. So we wanna give it an easier time by letting in more light. So um, Kathleen, to answer your question, some lenses that you could look at um, are gonna be something like the 20 millimeter 1.8. That's gonna be, oh, yeah. that's actually within Nikon, that is the widest and the um, most low light performing as a combo that you can get for that system. Killer lens for that kind of work. Um, you know, and that's assuming that we're talking specifically um, 
Nikon themselves as a brand. Some other ones that you can look at if you want maybe something a little bit more versatile or something that's wider, you can look at something like a Tamron 15 to uh, 30, which is a 2.8 lens, but you got about five more millimeters. That really does make a difference for showing more of the foreground. Right, especially since she's also interested in landscape to get that real wide sweeping landscape view. Exactly. So that being a good choice. That does really help. A nice in-between if you're somebody for landscape that wants to still utilize filters, which are super important, can't stress it enough. You know, your polarizers, your neutral densities, um, the 15 to 30 or the 14 to 28 from Nikon, those are both bubble lenses on the front. They're not gonna mm. create a fisheye effect, but they're gonna have that bubble. You can't use filters. So to kind of get around that, um, Nikon's answer to that a while ago was a 16 to 35 F4. Nice for landscape, not great for Astra. It's going to start to be tough for Astra, right? Yeah. A little rough. So one of the ones that you could look at for that would be uh, kind of in, a really sweet in-between. There's a 17 to 35 from Tamron. It's less than $1,000, which is really sweet. The way mm -hmm. they got around having the versatility and the ultra-wide is the fact that it at 17, we've got 2.8, which is great. But as we zoom in, it'll eventually go to an F4. If you're, you know, doing uh, landscape, sunsets, sunrises, situations like that where we're cutting light, it's totally okay that we're cutting a little bit. You're going to be at like F16 for your landscapes anyway. Exactly. I want to see that rich, tasty sky that I just want to eat with a fork. It's so delicious. Those are going to be things. I actually <laughs> that with somebody. Seriously, somebody understood how to underexpose to get a good sunset today, and it looked like cotton candy. It was delicious. <laughs> But that's what happens when you know how to shoot and you're using the right lenses. But something like a 17 to 28 might be, you know, within that uh, as kind of a, a thing. Yes, Rich, another one to look at would be a Tokina line. They, um, the 11 to 20 is a really good one. Uh, they have, um, yeah, that is the full frame version. Just make sure you don't do the 11 to 16 because that's a crop sensor. Used to have that mm -hmm. lens. Loved it, but that would be another one to look at. We would probably go towards the Tamron if we wanted weather sealing. So yeah, that's my TED talk. <laughs> You're welcome. You're, You're welcome. welcome. All right, so let's take a look at, let's see. Speaking of filters. Yeah. So I had a question. Uh, when do you use a polarizer? Do you ever use it indoors? Do you just leave it on your camera or do you only pull it out in specific situations? Good question. So with polarization, um, you got to remember, well, what's it doing for you? You know, a polarizer is designed to reduce glare on a lot of different objects. It is also designed to um, help you with highlight blowouts, give you better skies for that reason, help with maybe shining your skin if someone's a little, you know, glossy. Mm -hmm. um, or if you're trying to get reflection through water or things like that. So the situations that I recommend for people, if you're outside, use a polarizer. You know, even if the sun's at an angle that you're not gonna get actual glare reduction, mm -hmm. you're still gonna cut just a little bit of light, not enough to mess up your exposure, but you're still gonna get better colors and you're still gonna get better skies. Right. Now, of course, the caveat being, if it's completely cloudy, the light's diffused and it's not polarized and it's not, exactly. it's just gonna cost you extra light, right, on a cloudy day. Now, if you're working with water or stuff like that, you can still help with some of that. Uh, yeah. So that would be one big exception to the rule. Yeah. Um, you're doing landscape photography, sunset, sunrises, anything involving any of that, bring a polarizer. It's Heck the one yeah. thing you can't fix in post, so you might as well shoot it right the first time. As yeah, far yeah. as the inside conversation, there are specific areas where I might recommend that somebody utilize a polarizer. Maybe you're photographing product that has a reflective surface. The one thing they don't work on very well is metal. Um, mm -hmm. Metal is, you know, if it's a stainless steel refrigerator, you're not getting it out. But if it's car with a matte uh, paint job, it might help with that. Yeah, yeah, you can mess around with your reflections a bit. Exactly. If you're doing real estate photography and you've got a really glossy um, hardwood floor or countertops that you want to work on, use it in that environment. Yeah. Yeah. But like kid's birthday party, pull it off. Right? Yeah. No. It's no. all it's doing is costing you another stop and a half, two stops of light. Exactly. Yeah. But that's why those filter threads are so easy. And that's also why you want to make sure to not torque it onto there. Yes. 
yeah, otherwise you're on there with like the, the jar opener grippy thing trying to get it the heck off of there. Yeah, if you ever do get your uh, polarizer or filter stuck on there, free tip, rubber bands. Yes. I can just yep. give you a Perfect. little bit of a grip. If you're really stuck, bring it in. We can help you out. Yeah. How are the plans looking for dance camera trips in the future? Oh, good question, Jim. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here's hoping that when the weather starts to warm up, <laughs> yep. we're going to be able to run some group trips and outings again, especially the outdoor stuff, right? Lakota Wolf Preserve uh, and our other outdoor outings and trips to places. Yeah, I'm actually going to be working on the calendar for that stuff uh, real soon. Like this month, I'm going to start seeing what we can get on the calendar for the rest of the year and planning out our trips. We definitely, we got to get back to Lakota Wolf Preserve. Our last trip got called on account of weather because like a downpour just blew in and we wound up not going. Um, so I, go. I still have to go. <laughs> ben still has to go. We got to get Ben out there. Let me out. We're so it has to happen. <laughs> so yeah, Jim, to answer your question, we are, we're working on it right now. Uh, and hopefully sometime in the spring and in the summer, we can start getting some of our outings together, like some of our old favorites, Lakota Wolf Preserve, definitely in the mix. We love those guys. It's one of my favorite trips. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward to get out there again. Uh, some of our smaller outings, our little shoot to learn sessions and our smaller photo outings. Uh, I know that we had a great time this past year getting out there and having a chance to get outside with uh, Margaret Young and her birds of prey and doing her, oh she's God. a falconer and we did those falconry workshops and those what were experience. absolutely a blast. Yeah, that's a really so, one. I mean, and the photos that came out from our students, I mean, you know, I will say it probably nice to have a little bit of guidance from our wonderful instructor, but what an amazing <laughs> crop of photos we saw from uh, so many of our students. Just great light, great events, really talented shots. Very cool to see. And yeah, yes, yeah, Jim. Yep, like I'm sure in the spring we'll still be taking precautions. Like when we were out there doing night sky photography or doing the falconry stuff, we were outside, but we were, you know, we're in masks and we brought hand sanitizer and like everybody can kind of spread out and do their thing. And we still had a great time with it. Right. Exactly. So definitely looking to it forward to it when the weather warms up and we can get back out there. For sure. All righty. So uh, let's see other questions that came in. I bought a reflector. What do I use all these different sides for the five in the venerable five in one reflector? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so a reflector is a, uh, for those of you who don't know, that's a, a tool where, you know, it's usually a circle, um, you know, and it's going to bounce light onto a subject. Hey, one of those. Very cool. Very prepared. I, like I got the tiny little one that I love for like little product and macro work. Oh, not to mention, you know, you can back up and still hit a larger surface. So a lot of people don't know that. And it's a wonderful. Hack. Yeah. So what you're kind of getting at, you know, our five in one reflector, for example, it has a golden side. It has a white side. Thank you, Dana. It has a silver side on the inside that can be swapped out. And it also has a black side. All of those things are going to give a different quality of light or in the case of the black side, a lack of light. Um, so first off, we would use the white reflector side because it's not metallic. It's going to be a very soft fill. It's great for um, getting portraits under the chin. Like if I were to oh, hold my thing, you know, if I were to hold my light over, it's going to kick light back under here and create a much more even result. You see that? Uh, but because it's white, exactly. Yeah, it's very dramatic. You should just do that for every single one. Hello. Melkin stuff over. No, I'm good. Gravity works. <laughs> Um, yeah, always check your surroundings. So with Pretty what we're going to get a very neutral tone and a very soft reflection without any kind of harsh shadows. On the other side of things, if you were to use the gold reflection, it's bouncing yellow light. So what's that going to do to your subject? It's going to give a warmer tone. There are some really great uh, examples. So um, let's say maybe you've got a group shot where, you know, you've got somebody like me who's a little bit more tan, and then you would have maybe like my fiance who's a little bit more fair skinned. In comparison to me, she's going to seem even paler. You could use a golden reflector to kind of give her a little bit more of a sun-kissed glow, if you will. It's good for helping skin tones just a little, look a little bit more warm. 
in that same spirit though, let's say you want to do a, a family portrait during golden hour. We love golden hour. But, you know, if you're like maybe in Monocacy Creek or somewhere that it's kind of a bowl in there with all those trees, sunset happens pretty quick. You're not going to get that sunlight yeah. you're looking for. You can use that to kind of fake it and get that light back. So when someone says, hey, we're running late, instead of you panicking, you can say, OK, no problem. And you can <laughs> apply that light and more importantly, put it where you want. Right, right. Yeah, like I'm supposed to be taking some pictures like we're going to go outside, we're going to take some pictures and it's cloudy. Well, we can throw a little like little warm sunlight in there just by throwing that. Gross. Or, you know, you want to do that really nice uh, sunset portrait uh, with a family or some friends or yourself or a wedding couple or something like that. I always come back to weddings. I love weddings. You do a lot of weddings, do you? <laughs> I do love weddings. They make me so happy. Um, but they're also just a great proving ground for all sorts of photography. So, you know, on the East Coast, we don't get sunsets at the beach. We get them at the bay. Bay's kind of gross. I want to. <laughs> so by using that reflector, I can put that golden light back on them where I want, and we can fake it, right. which is great. And because you know where that light is, you're going to be much more confident in using that tool. Um, you know, it's great with a friend. I've had people, you know, post them up. If you're always working alone, we do have accessories to hold them to a light stand. Oh right, uh, yeah. So you know, that's a good little segue there. Moving on to the silver side, we're going to use that when I want that nice high contrast that the gold is going to give me because it's silver, but I'm looking for more neutral tones. I'm looking for a little bit more of a pop because it's more of a reflective surface. Maybe I want the neutral tone that the white would have given me, but I need more. Right. So I have higher That's a lot more uh, crispy. Uh. Exactly. <laughs> crispy, crunchy, contrasty, gorgeous for all of that. It's also phenomenal for black and white portraits. If you've been wondering how oh, they right, right. gorgeous silver quality or that pop off of the hair or things like that, I really wish I could share off of my computer right now. <laughs> I have some wonderful photos I could show you. That's a really great area to use a silver reflector. So I need yeah. more intensity or I want to make my black and white photos more interesting. That would be kind of where I characterize that. Now, the last thing would be black. Black is kind of the pun intended, dark horse, if you will. So now, you know, we, we've been using all of these things for, um, yeah, exactly. So we've been using all these things to bounce light and increase light on a certain area of our subject. Black being non-reflective, we're gonna have what's called negative fill. We're gonna be able to control our lighting more if maybe you're using a softbox or the light that you have is maybe wrapping around to the side of the face that you don't want it to. You're gonna be more in control by putting it there. It will mitigate that light from wrapping and getting into that area of your photo right. so you can be more in control and create the look and the vibe and the mood that you're going for right so when you want this side to be nice and dark but the light's just bouncing around the room and you need to cut some of that out of there exactly yeah. and then there's this guy oh that's right like the diffuser comes out the scrim yes so yep. when someone says hey, can we photograph? And you look outside and it's bright and horrible and you're getting Cro-Magnon brows and all of your subjects look like this and it's really disgusting. And you're like, oh, this is going to be terrible. Or <laughs> the lighting schedule isn't working or you want to be in an area that that time of day, a lot of this comes down to time of day. Mm -hmm. The lighting's just too harsh. You now have your own personal cloud. You put yeah. that in any light source, it's going to soften and diffuse immediately. Nobody likes to be squinty during their photos. That makes a big difference, but it just gives a softer quality of light for any kind of work. Um, yeah. I highly recommend it. The small one that Scott has, I highly recommend it for flower photos and things like that. And it's oh, yeah. way really small, but you're able to control your lighting environment a little bit more. Yeah, I use this thing for macro all the time because I can just like shade this and like stick that right in there. Yeah. Yeah, super soft light over whatever tiny little thing. Exactly. And I, it doesn't need to be huge because I can just be in like this close. Right. Yep. You know, time of day can do us a lot of favors, but obviously the weather changes. We're running late, something like that. Our location lighting isn't good. It all comes back down to light. This is one of those tools that allows you to say yes and give the work that you want to do more. Yeah. Often. So it's always in my car. I literally always have one of these in my car. I think I've got three different sizes. Well, there you go. I've occasionally used like, I'm going to take this big one and I'm going to just flop it down on the ground so that like the model has something nice to sit on, isn't going to get grass all over her dress. 
and Very then take it. Like, that's smart. <laughs> yeah. That's or like smart. if you've got a big enough one, it can be an impromptu background. Like, yeah, they're good for all kinds of stuff. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That gold would be really interesting. So what else we got going on? Let's see. Affordable zoom lens you'd recommend to a Canon gal. Hi, Nicole. Well, it depends on what kind of things you want to zoom in on and what kind of budget that you have. If you're still with us, I'd love to hear um, what kind of things you're trying to photograph and what lenses you have already. Um, a lot of people- uh, The old it depends or, answer. Yeah, the, the old it depends answer. My job is to be the expert, but that means having a lot of knowledge up in this noggin. So I could just throw out eight different lenses, but I want to make sure that I'm recommending specifically for you. Um, one of the really great ones for a little bit more zoom, but a lot of versatility for Canon would be something like an 18 to 200. Those are usually running about 200 to 249, somewhere in that ballpark. That can be really nice, but it's one lens for the wide angle and the zoom kind of stuff. So that's all good to look at. Um, another one that you could look at is uh, like a 70 to 300. And don't forget to utilize our uh, used case. I mean, right now, I've got a lot of different zoom lenses. It really just depends on how much of reach you're looking for. And we have that target set up out back, mostly portraits, but I'd like to use it for landscape and maybe astro. Wow, that's a big range. Okay. Yeah, it's a big deal for one piece so, of glass to handle. Okay. So one of the ones that you can mm. look at um, that's going to give you, you know, for portraits, we usually want something like a zoom lens because um, that's going to be more uh, flattering for your subject and for landscapes, of course, too. Um, Astro, there are some special considerations when you're using a long lens. So that would be um, something that Scott can get into a little bit. But to answer that question, I would probably recommend looking at something like a 70 to 200, uh, 2.8. I have a couple in used right now. That's a professional level lens. Give me a second. I can check that real quick. Yeah. Yeah, but we're looking for that. If you're looking for portrait and if you're looking for astro, then we're definitely looking for that large maximum aperture, right? We need to let in a ton of light for astrophotography. So we want that aperture to open up as wide as it possibly can. But then on the astro photography, well, on the portrait photography side, you're going to want that large maximum aperture so you can get that nice subject separation, get that bokeh, get that soft focus in the background yep. for My your portraits. My 200 so, is probably the most yeah, valuable yeah. lens that I have. Um, so those guys right now with a 90 day warranty, they're running 1149, just, you know, for, um, perspective, that's, you know, over a $2,000 lens, brand new. Um, one of the other ones that you could look at if used isn't your thing, um, you can look at the Tamron 70 to 200 brand new. It's got super effective stabilization. It's really sharp, which is good. Um, but that guy's usually about 1200. So that would definitely be kind of what you're looking at when you're looking for, high low light performance and really good sharpness and usually a longer range affordable becomes relative you know there are lenses when that within that range that can be three four thousand dollars um you know sometimes affordable is a lens that's under five hundred dollars and that really works but if you're looking to have low light and background blur and being able to use it in, in uh, darker scenarios like stars you need to up your low light game now, the other way that you could go with that, and I would highly recommend it if you're okay with letting go of the zoom feature, okay, a higher focal length, like an 85 millimeter is stunning for portraits, great for those longer distance landscapes where I want to have more of the, um, the scene kind of stacked on top of each other like mountain ranges, but it's going to let in even more light than that lens. That's going to put you in, you know, retail Canon world, that's going to be, you know, less than $500, something like the highly sought after uh, Tamron 85, which is stabilized and weather sealed, that's going to be about 749. So less than $1,000. So there's a couple different ways that you can go over that. So there are definitely some ways, hi, Nicole. So there are some ways that you could kind of look at that still, but you're still going to be looking at maybe um, more like a prime lens. Um, mm -hmm. maybe a 50 millimeter or something like that. Um, that's a lot of different uh, features for that lens to focus on. So it might be good to do an affordable portrait lens and maybe an affordable uh, star lens and just kind of separate it into that category and decide which one you want to focus on first. That's why there's so many lenses. You know, it's not supposed to be the, the you know, one, one lens to rule them all. Forgive me for being a nerd. Um, <laughs> 
But you know, that's why there's so many different options. So we can kind of talk that through. One of the yeah. things to really help us, if you want to come in at some point or DM us on Instagram, I want to see your photos. I want to see what you're getting now. And I want to see what you're not pleased with. And better yet, I want to see what you want to get. Screenshot other people's photos and send them to me so I can get an idea of, okay, well, that's what you need to do. And we can say, you know what? And this is because I don't work on commission. I can say, you know what? You want to focus on that. That's the kind of work that you want to achieve. This is going to be the time of year for you to save your pennies. And then we'll focus on that lens and that's the perfect one for you. Or we could say, you know what? If we back off of this priority and maybe look at this a little differently, this would be perfect for where you're at right now so you can get up and running. Right. So I hope that helps you. Yeah. I mean, even something maybe like the venerable 50 millimeter F 1.8. Yeah, it's going to let in a ton of light. It'll probably it will be a pretty decent portrait length. That's I mean, for a, a short portrait in a photojournalistic sort of way. Yeah, and definitely less than four hundred dollars. So that would oh, definitely yeah. kind of handle that. You know, I mean, you're not going to be photographing sports. You know, zoom is relative, but, you know, you're going to be able to blur out the background and get really good low light and really good portraits. Speaking of which, there's a quick question in here about the Sony G Master 35 millimeter f 1.4. Uh, How's that thing looking? Oh wow, um, that is a new release. So G Master is considered Sony's uh, highest end line. Um, those are going to be, you know, what they consider to be the best that they do. Um, I'm actually excited for that because I'm a Sony shooter myself. So. Um, what we're seeing from the 35 millimeter, um, this is a new one for them that they haven't released since been heavily weighted upon. So 35 millimeters, great full body portrait length, great for storytelling, great for Christmas morning, um, great for any kind of situation where maybe I want to do a little bit of close focus. Um, mm -hmm. Just phenomenal for all sorts of scenarios, but great for the low light. We are seeing already, it is much sharper than both the 35 millimeter 1.8 that exists, as well as the um, the 35 millimeter 1.4 Zeiss that's been around for a few years. Definitely, oh, wow. edges, definitely uh, in the middle. The other thing that we're seeing, chromatic aberration, which is kind of if you're shining uh, a light on brighter subjects, um, you're kind of this purple fringe, which is kind of ugly and terrible. Um, it is something that is relatively fixable on a computer, but this handles it much, much better. So that's kind of cool. cool. Uh, focusing speed is exactly what we want to see from that lens uh, as well. It does have a price tag around 1400 so that is a consideration. But this is a professional piece. You know, it's one that we've kind of been waiting on, but it's of a, a level of performance that we're very, very happy to see. So we're eager to get our hands on it. I will be buying one if that tells you anything. But also, um, so if there's anybody that wants to buy a 35 millimeter 1.8, hit me up in like three months. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, I'm on Dan's time. So that is a lens that right now is going to be what we call a pre-order. So if uh, you want that lens, it's going to be a while until you can just see it. You know, just being able to see something, kind of a luxury in, in COVID's world and, uh, you know, in the high-end world for this kind of stuff. Right. So you can call, you can order it online as far as putting down $100, which I believe is, as of right now, going to be refundable because it will be a lens that we're looking to stock. But that's going to be how you get your hands on it. If you say, hey, this isn't the lens for me, I guarantee someone else behind you will want it. So no yep. pressure. But it's 100 bucks. It's not a big deal. How's that? Um, how do you feel about that trio of Sony Primes that Tamron released about a year ago now? Oh, so the uh, the twenty, the twenty four, and the thirty five two point eight. Yeah, they're really impressive. They have some really neat features, and for being so almost downright dirty affordable. Um, what's really nice about them is their low light performance is excellent, and their size is super attractive. I mean, they're they're cupcake size. Mm -hmm. But one of the great thing is they're pretty much all about the same price. So, you know, if you wanted the 35 for the kind of work that you do, but you could have theoretically only afforded the 20, that's okay. It's all the same price. One of the big benefits though um, for it that they did was they included a half macro. So instead of a one-to-one -one ratio, which is what we would oh, see in right. a yeah. official macro lens, this is going to give you very close to that by about half, um, which most lenses can't even achieve. So 
it's a really, really versatile option for somebody to looking, you know, to get into that kind of work without spending a thousand dollars, you know, so that's kind of, cool. but the focusing motor still does a very good job. It's not going to be as zippy as a, you know, five, three, you know, five or, you know, thousand dollar lens, but it's still going to be a lot faster than, you know, like <laughs> the, the 50 millimeter 2.8 that's been out forever. The mm -hmm. optical performance is excellent though. So we're going to see that being useful for um, people that wanted to maybe get into star photography. Um, you know, they can use the manual focus ring. The focusing speed can just not be a part of the conversation. Right. Or we're going to use it for street photography, but super affordable and a great way to throw that in the back. Oh yeah. And they're tiny. That's going to be a perfect street lens. It's so tiny. It's great. Cool. Oh, thank you, Jim. Another good question. So and Nissi filter holders, any other recommendations? Ooh, that's tricky. Um, I've talked to Nikon even themselves. So for people that are curious about what that question means, that lens is something that we touched on earlier. That's what we call a rectilinear bubble. So it doesn't create a fisheye look, but it has that fisheye front. So you can't screw a flat filter onto it. Um, mount holders exist. They're going to clip on the entire lens themselves and they're going to hold that big square filter. Good for um, long exposure work as well as sunset landscape kind of work, those big filters. Um, those filters are a little hard to get on. Uh, it was kind of amazing. I, I spoke with uh, a Nikon rep about a year ago. I said, hey, what are some options that you recommend for this wonderful lens that you guys manufacture? And he just kind of said, well, I know they exist. <laughs> well, that's helpful. Not my first recommendation on an answer, but unfortunately it is very truthful. Um, there are holders that exist, um, you know, they're very limited, but they do exist. A lot of cinematographers use them for that reason as well. Fortunately, it's just not something that we carry in the store because the demand is so low. Um, oh, well, I'm glad I'm hit the nail on the head, Jim. So with that, you know, you can probably look at Koken. They might have some stuff as well. Koken is something that we can get into. I know um, Filters just got a huge revamp within ProMaster, which is kind of, you know, our uh, ace in the hole as far as filters are concerned. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, they're just not addressing it because it's it's really at the top shelf of a niche environment. That's for such a niche thing. Yeah. They exist. Um, <laughs> if Nissi sells one, you know, that would be the way to go. Unfortunately, that won't necessarily be something that we can get our hands on for you. Charlie has a question. <laughs> you saw me hold up my camera in a previous video. <laughs> New thoughts on time is XT3 of interest. One like to hear thoughts from someone other than a YouTuber. Um, <laughs> not to denigrate the YouTubers, but um, so cool. that's this little thing. Uh, and I am the odd one out that's shooting on Fuji around here. But um, Fuji's great. I've, I've been super happy with it. I've I've really enjoyed this thing. It's not a thing that we regularly stock. This would be a special order, but we can get them in. Yes, I mean, uh, that's the thing. Just because we don't have it in the case doesn't mean we can't get it. Oh yeah, for sure. You know that's yeah. support local. We're just going to take a full deposit for that. When it comes in, we'll give you a call, but we will do that for you. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I love it to death. I mean, I'm. It's not. It's a different tool. Um, and I know it's so much like personal preference. Um, there are some things that I like. Everybody makes a good camera, right? Um, I just really like the way this handles and I like the way it feels in my hand. And I like the way the controls work. Um, the reason that I upgraded to the X-T3 from my ancient X-T1 was specifically because this has a ton of great video features. It shoots very, very nice video. Uh, I really like um, the option to be able to go into an external recorder and record like 422, you know, um, log footage and it's great. But I like the internal, what they call the Eterna film simulation for uh, video. And then like it doesn't require as much in post-process but still captures a nice it's range great for me. And gratification, yeah. Yeah, I really, really like it. Um, I love the, the thing that I like about this camera is specifically one, the handling and the way that the thing just fits in my hand and the way that the controls sit under my fingers. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that everybody talks about is Fuji's handling of color. I just really like, 
I shoot raw plus JPEG all the time. Um, and since I switched to these guys, I find myself using the raw files less because the JPEGs that come out of the camera are just, just so pretty. No, but because, <laughs> but because I can dial in, like I've already done the work ahead of time to say, okay, this is the kind of color profile I'm looking for, and this is the way I want you to handle the highlights and the shadow. And it's so customizable, and I can dial in my own little recipe for, yeah, this is what I want these pictures to look like. And then, like the JPEGs are real pretty, and I've no lie, like hand over my heart, sometimes get, I'm getting JPEGs out of this that I can't make things look like that in Lightroom. I can get close, but I can't quite get there. And honest to God, sometimes I like the JPEG better sure. than what I can produce with the raw file. Now I'm shooting JPEG plus raw because there are times when I want that extra editing flexibility, right? So it's like 60, 40 and the other 40, I'm going to go to that raw file because I'm going to be able to pull in extra dynamic range because I'm going to have the extra data to play around with. Yeah. Um, So what but overall, you, yeah, super happy with it. Well, Scott, now I'm a little curious. Too. What would you maybe like equate that? Like, what are the competitors to like an XT3 if someone's on the fence? Um, honestly, like the other thing that I'm looking at is I'm comparing it to Sony. Okay. Right. And Sony's absolutely like killing it with a bunch. <laughs> Stop shaking the camera. All right. Sorry. I'm holding it still because this one doesn't have in body image stabilization. Yeah, that's a big so, feature, right? So if I were like, a like that's one of the like that's one of my looking at uh, the XT4 got the in body stabilization. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the one real drawback to this one, and the one real reason that I would look for upgrading. Yep. Right. Um, and then on, you know, if I were looking at some other system, like Sony's been doing very good things with like their autofocus system absolutely knocks it out of the park. Yeah, I'm pretty spoiled with that. Yeah, yeah. But they've done some things that have kind of improved, like their color science has gotten. Okay, yeah, I mean- Real you know, interesting recently. That's, what, that's what's fun about this. I mean, there is no perfect camera. I mean, that's- Yeah, yeah that's for sure. Keeps all of this inter interesting, like me. I'm really happy with what Sony's doing, but I'm able to play with stuff. You have some very specific needs that you do for both picture and video and as an instructor. So it's wound up being a really beautiful tool for you. And I will be the always the first to say, Fuji's just beautiful. I mean, just <laughs> the handling the experience, it's it's very romantic, um, if, if you will. So that's something that- I mean, you're don't... talking to a guy who will voluntarily walk around and shoot one of these things. Exactly. <laughs> Is it, I'm not going to say there's not a romanticism involved. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of love based on this, you know, so whatever you choose, I mean, keep in mind that we can get that for you. Um, so if that's something that you're really interested in, call tomorrow. I mean, we can definitely set that up for you. That's not a problem. And reach out to Scott, too. I mean, if you want to pick his brain a little bit more, I can volunteer him for that. <laughs> not my brain. All right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, film simulations, controls are what drew my interest. Used to using a film SLR. So yeah, okay. Kind of in that ballpark. Sweet. Cool. So we've got about, you know, two, three minutes left. Um, Y'all, you're so welcome, Carol. <laughs> I miss you. I hope you're doing well. Amazing wildlife photographer people. Oh, yeah. I can't say that I taught her everything she knows, but I'm, I've been uh, very pleased to see her grow in her journey, which we always love doing. I mean, that's we love photography and we love sharing that. So it's been fun yeah. to see, you know, another one of our clients grow. Um, but yeah, for those of you, we've got a couple more minutes left. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Um, you know, or if you're catching this after work or, you know, tomorrow morning or something like that, write still in the comments. <laughs> write still in the comments, um, you know, and we will get back to those because I, I guarantee that your questions are valuable for more than just you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you've got a question, somebody else is holding on to the same question, right? Yep. And uh, you'll always be able to catch the replay here on Facebook or on YouTube. Yep. Right? We're simultaneously broadcasting to both and they are always there that you can go back and check these things out. Definitely. And uh, for these questions that come up, even if you're not specifically like in the area or you don't wanna make a special trip in, we do have those virtual video consultations where kinda like this, like we can hop on to uh, 
a quick virtual call with you and like show you stuff and actually like work over things or show you pictures or take a look at your pictures, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you are not coming into the store or if you're a little further outside the area and don't feel like making the drive. Yeah. Hit us up for the, the we virtual content for you guys, you know, so it's convenient. So utilize that tool. I mean, it's free for grab and for crying out loud, uh, <laughs> but it's good for when, okay, I don't want to necessarily drive in or I don't have the time to drive in, but I just need to see what they're talking about or I need them to see what my problem is. I mean, that's what we're here for. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, it's seven o'clock, so I think we're going to wrap it up. I have any last minute questions in the chat? I don't see any more. I think we got everybody. Awesome. Well, That's thanks good. again for joining us tonight. It's been a blast sitting around and chatting and answering your questions. Um, join us again next week. We're going to keep doing this because we're having a ton of fun with it. Yeah. Thank you to Ben uh, for joining us tonight and fielding all your questions. And uh, thanks to all of you who are brave enough to voice your questions for the rest of us who uh, got Makes some information out of this. Because otherwise it's just us talking and that's just not fun. <laughs> I can sit here and talk to myself all day, but nobody wants that. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank Jeff. you, Jim, for joining us. Thanks, guys. Hey, Mr. V. <laughs> all righty. Well, on that night, I, uh, I bid you adieu. Cheers. All right. Night, everybody.